begin, welcome. And without any uh, more delay, I'll turn it over to uh, Mark. Uh, thanks, Dee, and welcome everybody. This is the first of a two-session webinar on uh, green strategy for the environmental movement and the Green New Deal and uh, how ways in which we can all participate in creating a livable world. Um, I want to say it's the so the two sessions are tonight and next Sunday at the same time, same uh, bat blaze, same bat channel. Um, and uh, just to let you know, I have a, as you may see on your screen, I have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but there'll be about three times during the course of this where I stop and ask for questions and comments. And you can just use your hand icon, uh, raised hand icon to uh, indicate that you'd like to speak and D will unmute you for that um, when those, when those, uh, we take those breaks and comment if you want. If you don't, there's no need to. That just means we'll get through a little earlier. So in this first session, <clears throat> I'm going to cover the interconnectedness between the environmental crises that are piling up fast around the world and the social and economic issues that are also uh, reaching uh, crisis tipping points and how the ways in which they are, those are all interconnected. I'm going to talk a little bit about why capitalism is the main cause of environmental crises and it's also the main obstacle to finding real solutions, lasting solutions. Um, I'm going to talk about the need for systems change. Uh, not just it's not just about personal purity. Um, so one of the things that's uh, I think a little different about my approach is that most of the books that you see on uh, the climate crisis and other things focus on either explaining the science or explaining the, what the research, new research is, or they talk about, you know, 50 things you personally can do to save the world. And very little has been done to focus on what comes in the middle of that, which is the movements for change, because my contention is we need fundamental change in a whole number of systems, including our economic system. And that doesn't happen without a powerful movement. And so we do need to focus not just about being personally pure and moral and being able to look down your nose at somebody else, but rather focus on how to build a movement to create change. And that also relates to the fact that environmental issues and environmental crises are uh, also about class, about the working class, about the power of the working class, because any efforts to make fundamental change are conflicts about power. And in honor of the fact that this year is the 100th anniversary of the CPUSA, I'm going to have a little bit about Marxism and the environment and the history of our party on environmental issues. Uh, next week, we're going to cover why activism is key and the ways in which environmental issues are growing factors in almost all struggles, electoral and political struggles. Talk a little bit about the recent climate strike, uh, which had over 7 million people around the world participating in September. Uh, talk a little bit about the Green New Deal, what it is and what it isn't, what it's already accomplished. A little about socialism and why we need socialism, why socialism is a necessary, though not sufficient, condition to enable us to solve environmental problems. And we'll also cover then what you can do, personal, political, electoral, and organizational steps that you can take. This webinar is based on my book, Green Strategy, Path to Fundamental Transformation. And if you have have it already. I thank you very much and hope you've uh, gotten a lot out of it. And if not, uh, you can find it at international publishers. That's intpubnyc.com. Um, and uh, there are also many other fine books on Marxism, on the history of our country, uh, autobiographies and biographies. But th that's where you'll find the book Green Strategy. So ultimately, climate change and other environmental crises are about people's lives. They're not uh, necessarily uh, just about 
climate change or other environmental crises as scientific studies, though they are that. They're not just about technology. They're not just about the transformation of systems. They're about the impact on billions of people. And that impact is already starting. Uh, that billions of people are currently facing environmental problems. Uh, and we're linked by our shared environment, but the ways in which those environmental problems manifest themselves might vary from uh, region to region, from country to country, from continent to continent. And I'll talk a little bit more about those different kinds of impacts, but they are all shared, uh, linked by that shared climate, shared environment, and the shared de dependence of all humanity on the natural world. Some examples, in many parts of the US West, I live in Washington State in uh, um, the Cascade Mountains. And in many parts of the US West, including where I live, we face danger from forest fires and floods, which are happening more often, and they're more extensive and intense. And that's how climate change is manifesting itself where I live. But in other places, for example, Florida, their sea level rise is the most immediately threatening thing. First from uh, the rising seas, but also incursion into our drinking water from the salt water from the oceans rising and uh, getting into the, the uh, fresh water that we've tapped for, for drinking and um, to help us survive. Um, and then eventually from uh, a rising sea level that will uh, wipe out many homes. Uh, and also when there's a storm surge, it starts at a higher level and it can overcome all of the infrastructure that we've built along our coastlines, which was built for the old normal. And the old normal doesn't apply anymore. In another place, Oklahoma, for example, they're having many earthquakes in which they had never faced before, and that's uh, been linked to fracking. Uh, whereas before they might have had one or two barely discernible earthquakes in a year, now they face hundreds uh, each year because of fracking and the intense pressure they put that puts on the ground that we live on. In Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Puerto Rico, hurricanes are more intense and bringing more rain with them, and they add flooding to the direct hurricane damage. Um, so all of these are caused by and linked by climate change, and it's true worldwide. There's more extreme weather, extreme drought. That happened in California, having a five-year drought. It's also happened in Australia, having unprecedented drought, uh, many places in the world. We have the spread of organic pollutants from industrial uh, uses and industrial waste and the improper disposal of that waste from agricultural pollution, from the uh, use of uh, pesticides. And those organic pollutants uh, threaten human and animal and plant reproductive systems. So they're not just a nasty thing in the air that you might not want to breathe. They're something that can fundamentally affect uh, our reproductive systems and uh, you know the future of the human race. Rising sea levels, declining fisheries, uh, many more. I've listed here some more, and there are many more in, uh, discussed in my book and any serious look at climate change. So we need a green strategy because we face a series of linked environmental problems and crises because those environmental challenges are interwoven with our political and economic systems because the solutions require more than minor fixes. Uh, uh, as I will discuss later, it's all very good to change light bulbs to buy the most uh, efficient uh, and least polluting car you can to make other personal changes, but those those minor fixes uh, won't address the size and scope of the problem. So we need fundamental fixes uh, and changes to many systems. And those real solutions require a long range vision because there are things we can do immediately, but there are other things that will take uh, years or decades to fix a protracted struggle and the fundamental transformation of our industrial agriculture, transportation, and many other systems. And it's not just climate change that's the problem. 
There's challenges to water, soil, pollution, and these are all linked and require that we work on them simultaneously. When we have water stress, that affects uh, human health and climate change also provides its own challenges to human health and makes the water stresses work. And if you work on one without working on the other, um, whatever you don't work on will come back to bite us. Climate change makes those other problems worse and more difficult to solve. And that, as time goes on, that, that will happen more and more. So we need an integrated understanding, an integrated plan to tackle the challenges, and an integrated movement to create that change. And I'd like to stop here for a minute and ask if anyone is, would be willing to share some local examples of the impact of environmental issues on your community or if there are local environmental struggles. We'll take uh, just a few minutes to share a few examples if anybody's willing. Okay, if you'd like to speak, please click the picture of the raised hand and I'll be able to open your mic. I'm scrolling through all of the attendees. Ishmael, your mic is open. Ishmael Para, your mic is open. Okay. Okay, Anyone let else? me, let me, okay, just a moment. Shane McAvoy, your mic is open. You have to click your mic on your end. There you are. Is that working? Yep, we can hear you. Hi, yeah, so I live in Brooklyn in, the, in New York. And one thing that's been happening to us is, of course, the Hurricane Sandy and the increased uh, flooding that has been going on and the white, you know, we have the Rockaways out there or down in the south of Queens and a lot of the beaches are eroding away and there's been a lot of flooding throughout the whole New York Harbor region and so one thing was saying is that we're going to need to start building seawalls or things like that, um, but that's something that came into my mind that mm -hmm. they're talking about trying to defend all these neighborhoods that are really built right on right on the sea level. Mm -hmm. Whole huge neighborhoods all the way at, around that perimeter of the city. So yeah. that's that's my bit. Yeah. And that's true around the world, some incredible proportion. I don't have the statistic in my head, but it's something like uh, something like close to half of our urban populations live within 50 miles of the of the of an ocean uh, and hence they're mostly all at at or near sea level and that'll uh, have huge impacts around the world and including impacts like i said for our whatever infrastructure we have was built for the old normal and that nor what's normal is changing rapidly can we take, is there one or two more and then we'll move on? Rob, your mic is open on our, you have to click your mic on your end. Just click the picture of your mic. Rob. There, there we go. Okay, I see it. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah, Hi, my name is Rob. I live in Phoenix. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, uh, one thing I noticed this summer uh, for climate change is that we get, uh, monsoon weather all summer long from say july till september at least and uh we virtually had no monsoon this uh summer so oh. I, I i that's very suspect because i've been here 20 years and never seen anything like this so yeah. just an example thanks that's true there's you know they the, the uh, it's not just that things are warming, it's that all these systems are changing in ways that we didn't predict and that af affects everything because our whole lives are embedded in the natural world and as the natural world changes around us that challenges human society. If, Lynn, if your mic is open. 
Yes, uh, in uh, Connecticut, for an example, actually Connecticut flowing into Rhode Island, the lobster industry has, has for all practical purposes, collapsed. Uh, the warming waters in Long Island Sound flowing out over to Rhode Island uh, did it along with some disease that um, Mark was talking about the interplay between these things. Disease set in also and hit the lobsters. So the lobster industry and on the jobs um, have gone with it. Um, mm -hmm. And the people north of us going from Cape Cod to the maritime provinces, which that's the Gulf of Maine, are very concerned with what happened down here because the Gulf of Maine is heating up faster than any other body of water in the world. Uh, and of course, there's a heavy dependence on lobstering uh, in the Gulf of Maine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A gr great example here in the Northwest, um, uh, along the coast, there's long been a, the oyster industry. And now they're having to start uh, oysters in Hawaii because the waters around Washington state and in, even down into Oregon are getting too warm for the proper development of the shells of the oysters. So they start their lives in Hawaii and then they're imported up to Washington state. So these ripple effects are happening all around us. Um, so I'm gonna go on and uh, we, there'll be several more opportunities for people to dive in. What we're talking about is all life linked in mutually interactive webs of relationships. The, the lobster men depend on there being lobsters and their jobs and their communities are dependent on the income from those jobs. And the, it's, it's all part of these whole giant series of webs in which we are all interconnected. And as any part of that web changes, it affects the entire web. Changes in nature affect humanity and changes in humanity affect nature. What we're talking about is the impact that the ways in which we produce, distribute and dispose of goods and materials uh, are have caused impacts on nature because um, uh, we're not, human society is not disconnected. It's not just the air we breathe or the, the water we drink, though those are crucial aspects of nature, but uh, we depend on the lobsters, we depend on the oysters, we depend on the weather patterns and the rain patterns and what we expect of storm surges and hurricanes and uh, this this whole web is is uh, becoming stressed in ways that we uh, uh, are not are not yet ready for. And that, what that means is there can't be a healthy humanity without a healthy natural world. Sometimes people say, oh, the, the earth is changing, we're killing the planet. We're, we're not killing the planet, but we are killing some of the chances for humans, healthy human survival on the planet. Uh, the planet will survive. The planet has had much more cataclysmic things happen in its billions of years of history than what humans are doing it to it, but it's human society that will um, have a harder time. We're creating a world that is working against us rather than us working with the natural world. We rely on nature and we rely on its limits. Uh, we can't legislate away the laws of physics or we can't just postpone action the way some Congress people want to do or get rid of regulations and pretend that that uh, we can ignore the laws of nature. We can't breathe something else. We have to have fresh water. These are requirements of our survival as humans. So the, the basic environmental problem is that we have an unsustainable escalating imbalance between humanity and nature. But we have to ask, it's not just a, a, a sort of random thing that's happened, there are causes of that imbalance. Our collective impact on nature has reached the point of increasing destructiveness. When there were uh, some millions of people rather than billions of people, the impact that we were able to have on the natural world was less and there was also uh, lots of land. So for example, in ancient Mesopotamia in the Fertile Crescent, where there was abundant agriculture, 
and when they over irrigated and over uh, uh, caused the ground to become inundated with salt as a result and the agriculture was destroyed people just moved somewhere else uh, but we've now there are so many people and our societies are everywhere and we've used up so much of the available land uh, there isn't some place else we can move to but the impact causing this imbalance is not just from numbers of people. It's from how we grow, produce, manufacture, and distribute goods and food, and how we dispose of waste. And almost universally, that's capitalism in today's world. Because capitalism is based on a model of infinite economic growth. But our world, our climate, and our capacity and our resources are finite and infinite and finite uh, don't work together. The environmental problems of capitalism are not bugs, but they're features of the system. If you uh, read some uh, capitalist apologists, for example, Al Gore, who has done a tremendous service at uh, talking about the climate crisis and how important it is, but he also uh, only wants us to get up to the point where we don't question the system. That's where he 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 want, he's ready to help. Let's let's work on changing technology and changing energy and changing laws. But when we start to say the system is the problem, that's where he wants to build a brick wall. Uh, but these things are not bugs, but features of the system. Um, Al Gore, among others, talks about capitalist accounting having a problem of externalities, uh, where uh, externalities are things that happen in the real world, but they don't show up on the accounting books. The impact of weight, industrial waste on the natural world, on the health of our children, on the water that we drink, on the air that we breathe, those aren't don't figure into um, uh, calculations of uh, profit and loss. They don't appear on company books. Uh, but that's not a bug, that's a feature of the system. The system, uh, the capitalist system is based on paying as little for natural resources as possible, paying as little as possible for the human labor to transform those into commodity, and paying uh, as little as possible for any waste products. And that's the way the system is designed. And capitalist economics demands the constant expansion of commodities, of markets, of GDP, and of profit, that infinite growth that somehow is going to happen in a finite natural world. Uh, you can see any time the GDP numbers fall, there's a, uh, a crisis. Everybody starts worrying about growth and what we can do to stimulate growth. But what they're talking about is the growth of markets and commodities and sales and profits. They're not talking about the growth of uh, humanity, ending income inequality, uh, having a safe world for us to live in. So the capitalist system is an obstacle to the fundamental changes we need. Capitalist economics makes decisions that affect all of us, but we don't all get to participate in those decisions. The decisions are based on what's best for private profit. Capitalists make decisions based not only on profits, they're increasingly uh, due to the pressures of the market, of the financialization of capital, uh, increasingly relying on very short-term profits. They're not looking 10 years or 20 years down the road. They're worrying about this quarter or next quarter. Um, it depends on that endless growth and paying as little as possible for all the components of industry and agriculture. Capitalist economics is based on exploiting labor and nature. And that's the opposite of what humanity needs, namely decisions based on what's in the interests of all humanity, decisions which are democratically made, humane decisions based on a long-term vision of what's best for humanity, decisions that recognize the limits of the natural world, and that enable humanity to work with nature rather than forcing nature to work against humanity. We need to merge science and politics. 
Uh, as many scientists were shocked to discover, it wasn't enough for them to uh, go and report to Congress that there was this big problem. Uh, they assumed that then the policymakers would address the problem and work to solve it. It's not enough to just have the science. We also have to have the politics. This environmental struggles are about the stresses and tears in this web of interconnected nature and human activity. The science helps us understand how and why they are linked and the ways in which we need to change to fix them. The politics helps us understand how to create change, how to build unity, how to overcome divisions, how to create a force capable of imposing the change we need on a resistance system. As Albert Einstein said, politics is more difficult than physics. Uh, so indeed, we can change individual habits. We can reduce, repurpose, recycle, reuse. We can drive less, eat less meat, use reusable grocery bags, stop using plastic bags, change our light bulbs. We can garden, we can plant trees, we can drive electric or hybrid vehicles if we can afford them. We can vote for environmental candidates. And all of these individual habits uh, will help, and I encourage people to do the best they can, and they will have the biggest impact when they're part of campaigns to uh, win adoption by millions of people. However, just changing individual habits is not enough. We have to change systems. For example, if we recycled 100% of personal trash, that would only solve 5 to 7% of the waste problem because waste is much bigger. It requires addressing industrial waste, construction waste, packaging, paper and other waste from offices, old computers, systems that compost and reuse waste. We have to find all of those, and we have to redesign many products and commodities so they are modular and the elements can be easily reused, so less waste is created in the first place. Things like this don't just happen because they ought to happen. They have to uh, be imposed, that change has to be imposed on a resistant system because many of the changes that we have to make in agriculture and industry and energy uh, only pay off in the long term. They don't pay off in the short term. They require a big upfront investment to make those kind of changes, to redesign products, redesign the factories, redesign the tools, redesign all of the ways in which we interact with nature. And that is expensive upfront and that cuts into profits, especially short-term profits. It's only necessary for humanity. <laughs> so this, we have these systems that are embedded in the world around us, in industry, agriculture, transportation, waste disposal, packaging, distribution, building construction and operation, energy systems, all related to capitalist economics. <clears throat> so we have to figure out how to change those many systems. They don't just change because we want them to or need them to. Systems only changed when organized groups of people force changes on a reluctant resistant status quo. They require building a movement that has enough potential power to implement fundamental change. And that's why activism is the single biggest contribution we can make. This is something that we'll talk about a lot more in the second session. Uh, this is a picture of the 2014 People's Climate March in, in uh, New York City. And if you look really closely right at the upper corner, you can see me coming around the corner. I was there along with a, a party contingent that we had that participated in that 400,000 strong, a demonstration which was dwarfed by the climate strikes that happened this September and will be, uh, I'm sure, happening again. This, as I said, this last one, there were over 7 million people around the world, the biggest coordinated set of international demonstrations ever. So I'd like to pause now for questions and comments and your thoughts. Okay, if you'd like to 
uh, make a comment or introduce a question, please click the picture of your hand of the hand so that we can open your mic. Alex, your mic is open. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to make a point about um, merging science and politics. I think it's important that we remember that you can't politicize the process of science. Science is and needs to remain an objective process for under uncovering truth. And what we I feel we need is uh, ethical mandate in the political process to give weight to scientific evidence in decision making. Uh, absolutely. I'm not talking about politicizing science. I'm talking about uh, merging uh, the scientific knowledge with the political process. Having scientists, for example, play a more active role in running for office, in uh, proposing changes uh, to society, in uh, helping us determine the best, best methods. However, I will say that no matter how objective the science is, just having good science isn't enough. Good science by itself won't change the world and we have to change the world. So that's why I'm talking about merging. I'm not talking about politicizing science, but I'm talking about uh, making uh, political decisions and economic decisions based on the needs of humanity and based on the best available science um, so that they are not uh, we don't have a silo problem where the science is over on one side telling us this disaster is coming and what we have now, a political system, too much of which is in a stranglehold of climate deniers and uh, politicians who've been captured by the fossil fuel industry or the pharmaceutical industry or some other industries. But you're absolutely, the science has to be objective and we need more science and more research and a bigger role for scientists in the political process. Uh, is there anyone else? Mm -hmm. Cindy, your mic is open, please, yes. I can hear me. We can. I'm asking about um, Extinction Rebellion. Um, could we, should we have been able to predict that these people were going to come along? Could we have known that they were going to be able to organize in this massive faction, um, fashion? And um, now what do we do? <laughs> um, well, we, some of that we'll cover in more detail uh, in the next session where I talk about much more about the movement. Um, I think we could certainly have predicted, we couldn't have predicted when it would come along, this, this upsurge that we're seeing now with the, the Sunrise Movement, the Extinction Rebellion, the climate strikes, um, and many other aspects of the movements to address environmental uh, issues. Uh, we can predict that it would happen because humans have a vested interest in survival. And as millions and millions of people become aware of the problems and become convinced of the problems and become convinced of the need for action, they will take action. Uh, we can't necessarily predict what form it'll take, uh, but we can predict that now that uh, this movement will not stop, it will continue to grow, uh, it will play a bigger role in elections, it will play a bigger role in policy and priority debates, it will play a bigger role in all the decisions of our society from whether to build a sea, how high to build a seawall, uh, to where stuff is grown, to whether we should transport um, uh, fresh vegetables in uh, what for us is winter time, we should, whether we should put them on an airplane and fly uh, fresh vegetables up from Chile or not, <laughs> whether that's a good use of our limited ability of nature to absorb the carbon dioxide that's admitted in the process. So these these are only going to get become bigger and bigger issues in our body politic in all forms. And we will talk more about the movement next time. Shelby, your mic is open. Uh, thanks. Uh, hello, Mark. Hi, um, Shelby. I just uh, tuned in, so uh, you might have already addressed this, so uh, I apologize if you have. 
two questions. Um, number one, did you talk at all or have you thought about or is there a time frame that we have to think about in terms of uh, being able to uh, make an, an impact, uh, a necessary impact, a time frame? That's number one. And number two, uh, in my block club, I might have uh, difficulty convincing my black members not to use straws. And that might be a heavy lift, lift, but to convince them that we have to change the system <laughs> might be an extra heavy lift um, mm -hmm. and, and, and really huge. Could you address those two? Yes. Thanks. Uh, well, on the time frame, the 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 best <laughs> there has to be a match between the scope of the problem and the scale of the solutions that we uh, propose. I disagree with those who say, for example, some of the best science tells us that we only have twelve years if we want to avoid some of the more catastrophic impacts 12 years to change from business as usual to a fundamentally different world where energy is produced differently where goods are produced differently where uh, we we uh, make major changes to the relationship between humanity and nature however i think if we're all here in 15 or 20 years, we can still have an impact on what happens. I don't think there's a deadline after which we can throw up our hands and give up. It's tempting to do so. The, the, the dire predictions are, are real and as we find out more, as we research more, as we understand more, um, we're, we're finding out that the, the consequences are on us faster than we thought, and they're more dire than we thought, and will require more money and energy and more change to fix. Uh, but there is never a deadline on our ability to act. Um, so, uh, however, the sooner we act and the more decisively we, decisively we act, the less it'll cost and the less of a change we'll have, less radical of a change we'll have to make. The longer we wait, we'll have to make more radical changes and it'll cost more and uh, the impacts will be heavier. So um, like I say, I don't, I'm not a, a fatalist. I don't think that we have 12 years and then we should give up if we haven't done it by then. I think we need to, uh, work now as hard as we can and make as much change as we can in those 12 years. And we will need to keep working after those 12 years are up, uh, no matter where we are. Um, so that's that's my take on the time frame. I don't think there's, uh, I don't think it's ever hopeless, um, but it, it will be get, get more difficult and more expensive. Uh, on the question of, of uh, straws and those things, I covered a, a little bit about this. There's, there's personal changes that we can make that I absolutely advocate us making those personal changes, but we have to change systems. So straws, uh, yes, it's better to use sustainable straws, use bamboo, use steel, use various other kinds of straws rather than disposable plastic ones um, for a great variety of reasons. There's the, the list of why to do that is a long one. Uh, from the fact that it's made often from petroleum uh, to the fact that our oceans are inundated with plastics and virtually every fish that we catch and eat has plastics in us and we are ingesting those plastics into our bodies. We do have an ally to convince people and that ally is reality. We're not just advocating a change to be personally pure or to be moral. We're advocating a change that's necessary for human survival, which has many, many components of which straws and plastic bags are one piece. I'm in favor of those cities where they ban plastic bags and charge for them and um, have easily available alternatives to plastic straws, but those are just the, the tiniest drop in the ocean of what we need to change. And part of it is our job to convince people is uh, that's on, our, on us to help convince them, 
but like I say, reality is, it's really the real world around us which will impact it. For example, in New York, as uh, somebody earlier talked about Hurricane Sandy, all of a sudden people who had never faced a hurricane in that part of the world before became convinced that climate change was a threat to their life and they started to make changes because of it. And every time there's a disaster, every time there's a storm, every time there's uh, a new study that helps us understand the impact of what we're doing, uh, we, we will gain allies and we will gain new arguments to help convince those people, uh, some of whom will be very hard to convince and some of whom uh, won't want to give up one thing or another. And it's our job to have a movement broad enough to welcome people at whatever stage they're ready to come in. If they're not ready to give up their straws, but they are ready to vote for environmental, uh, for candidates who support serious environmental action, that's that's the in with them. That's the first step they're ready to take. We should help them take that first step. Okay, I'd like to go on now to get through so that we, uh, I don't, uh, bore you to tears and talk too long. So I'm going to continue on. There'll be another opportunity uh, almost at the end for some more questions and comments. It's also important to understand that environmental issues are class issues. Too often uh, it's posed as if, well, we have to have balance. We have to balance the need for jobs and the need for profit with the need for environmental regulations. And if environmental regulations are too costly, um, then we, we, have to, we have to have this sort of balance, which too often is a, a balance of profit and loss rather than human life. Uh, and so there's efforts to pit the labor movement against the environmental movement. And those, some of those challenges are real ones. I don't want to minimize them. Uh, there are real and difficult choices uh, for, uh, for unions uh, fighting for jobs that their members desperately need uh, and the need for environmental regulations to have the kind of world where we can survive. Um, and those are real difficult issues, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about that next time. But we also have to understand that these, these environmental issues are class issues. They're issues of class power, because it's if all the good people in the world get up and say, let's make changes, that's not enough. You have to have the power of the working class to create fundamental transformation. Um, another reason that these are class issues is that workers face environmental challenges and pollution on the job and in our communities. They often get double and triple doses of whatever is happening in the community. It, if the waste that's dumped from an industrial plant affects the drinking water for tens of thousands of people, but it also directly impacts the workers in that plant who are forced to work with the, those uh, toxic chemicals. Struggles about safety on the job are environmental struggles. There's been some states, including Washington State, that have had battles for laws that uh, uh, called workers' right to know laws, where uh, workers have the legal right to know what toxic chemicals they're being forced to work with. And sometimes companies fight this, even though the laws don't make them change anything, they just demand that the workers be informed of what the, what toxic chemicals they're working with and the companies fight even that. But that's another example of the cross connection between worker struggles and environmental struggles. So we can recognize that most class issues have an environmental aspect. For miners, black lung disease, for example, which has been known about for centuries, which companies have fought for centuries to prevent workers from being able to control the practices in the mines, control the ventilation, control uh, the amount of regulation and inspection, and they, uh, companies and their bought and paid for politicians often try to escape having to pay those costs, and it's workers who pay. So the political, another way in which this is uh, environmental issues or class issues is that the political and economic enemies of workers' rights and of unions are the same people who are opposed to environmental regulation, who oppose socialized decision-making 
based on human need, who oppose health care for all, who oppose uh, family wage jobs, who oppose massive public works jobs, green jobs programs, who oppose women's rights and women's health care, who oppose immigrant rights and youth rights, who oppose action for equality and justice and democracy. In a way, they're telling us the coalitions we need to build. All of these people uh, who are trying to make a better world have a shared common interest and a shared common enemy. But environmental issues are also all class issues, like the threat of nuclear war and other kinds of terribly destructive war. Environmental degradation affects all humanity. Uh, even though capitalists use their wealth to try and avoid the impacts of environmental crises, they too have to breathe air and drink water and uh, need, need to have nature around them. And they, their lives too depend on the relationship between humanity and the natural world. Uh, and entire countries are already and in the future will happen even more that will be affected by resource wars, by the massive numbers of climate refugees who already number in the millions, and by health crises impacted by pollution and climate change. For example, the, as the world warms, the disease ranges where malaria is a problem are expanding. So places that never used to, used to be cold enough that they never had to worry about malaria are already being having their health impacted uh, by the changes in the natural world that we see. And when, when many more people are sick, that affects people of all classes. So there is uh, some self-interest among many. So it's possible to develop cross-class alliances. So Marxism, I think, gives us insights into both environmental crises and into the movement to solve them. And so I'll, uh, in honor of the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of the CPUSA, I'll talk a little bit about the Marxism and also our party's uh, history on environmental issues uh, before we uh, wrap up. Just a little history. So Marx noted, there's a famous quote, which I don't have the exact wording of, uh, but it says, to, it is to the effect that all progress in capitalist agriculture is based on increasing both the exploitation of workers, but also depriving the land of its ability to regenerate itself uh, as they take more and more um, of the uh, natural resources out of the land that leaves uh, less for the future. So Marx and Engels both uh, paid great attention to what the latest advances in scientific knowledge were at the time they were writing, and it behooves us as Marxists today to do the same. Dialectical materialism, Marxist philosophy, which gives great attention to the patterns of how ta change takes place, understands changes in the natural world in ways similar to the ways we understand changes in human society. Uh, one of the sections of my book talks a lot about dialectical materialism and uses environmental ag examples to explain dialectics and uses dialectics to help us understand what's happening in our environment. But for an even deeper dive into Marx, uh, John Bellamy Foster, who's the editor of a monthly review, uh, wrote a book, Marx's Ecology. So if you want a deep dive into the theory, that's one place to look. In the early Soviet Union, there were efforts to base laws and priorities on the latest science and technology and on human needs rather than profits. Uh, Lenin led the setting up of a mass massive national park system and nature preserves, which are still in existence today. Um, this was true in the experience and the experiments in setting up collective farms. Uh, given the limited resources that they had and the challenges they had, they tried to do so originally in ways that uh, were more in harmony with nature. However, much though not all of those early gains were set aside during the forced march to industrialization in the 1930s, driven by the threat of fascism, by the destruction uh, that happened during World War II, and then the post-war need to rebuild quickly. But uh, many, 
there were harmful things that happened uh, to the environment in the Soviet Union. There were also some very positive examples, green belts around cities, uh, placing industry farther away from where people lived. There was a massive effort to clean up Lake Baikal from uh, uh, paper plants, which were polluting uh, the, the biggest and deepest lake in the world, the biggest reservoir of fresh water. So there's, uh, I was trying to, this is just a little bit, there's more in the book uh, about uh, some of those examples. In our party, in the 1930s, one of our leaders, uh, Lem Harris, played a role in organizing farm work, farmers and applying Marxist analysis to rural issues, including land use and agricultural issues. So that's one example I know about, and Lem Harris's autobiography, I believe, is available from international publishers. <clears throat> in the 1950s, uh, many of us, uh, this was before my time, I was born and only born in 52, but around that time, the party was participating actively in collecting signatures for the Stockholm Peace Appeal against nuclear war and nuclear weapons and the environmental destruction that they cause. In the 1960s, our opposition to the Vietnam War included uh, opposing and exposing and condemning the use of Agent Orange and other environmentally destructive uh, military approaches using chemicals uh, to defoliate, which harmed not only uh, the Vietnamese people, but also the land that they depend on to grow food and also hurt U.S. troops, uh, something the Army denied for decades. Also in the 1960s, we supported the farm workers in the Great Boycott, and that included opposition to the exposure of farm workers to pesticides. And we've been active since the 20s in organizing miners uh, and including to address issues of black lung disease. Um, in the late 1950s, party activists, including my mother, Virginia Brodine, participated in forming a scientists and citizens committee uh, to talk about uh, the impact of nuclear testing. Um, and by the mid 1970s, uh, Virginia authored the first specifically environmental resolutions presented to our national conventions, uh, leading in the late 70s to our uh, changing uh, our position on nuclear power. And in the 1980s, she led the development of our of an environmental commission which drafted and published People and Nature Before Profits, our first environmental program. Also in the 1980s, uh, the Washington State Party issued several statements on environmental issues, jobs and trees, talking about the common interests of loggers and uh, workers and uh, citizens through the rest of society, and on the destructive harm that the Hanford Nuclear Res Reservation um, you know, was contaminating uh, downwinders and farmland and the Columbia River. And in the 1900s, uh, 1990s, sorry, and 2000s, we began to focus more on environmental issues. Every national convention has held a workshop or report. Uh, we issued a second edition of People in Nature Before Profits. In 2008, we had our first report to the National Committee on Global Warming and the movement to address it. At our 2014 convention, we had a panel on the environment as one of only three plenary panels, giving greater attention and emphasis to the issue. And our most recent convention, John Bechtel's main report, extensively addressed environmental issues and the climate crisis. And our draft program also places the environmental movement as a crucial element of the people's front against the extreme right. And in our view, the massive anti-extreme right coalition needs to include environmental organizations, need to include other coalition participants who focus on environmental issues related to their main work. Uh, <clears throat> for example, the immigrant rights movement, uh, some of the impetus for the waves of uh, climate refugees we're seeing from Central America has to do with the destruction of farmland and the harmful changes that are uh, happening due to climate change in Central America, where 
with uh, uh, the, the climate heating up, uh, disease ranges changing, animal ranges changing, uh, and water stress increasing, uh, it becomes more difficult for people to survive and they need to find somewhere to survive, uh, move to survive. And that's part of what's um, uh, driving some of the immigration. So those understanding the linkages between those issues and the ways in which almost all issues have an environmental aspect. We need to build unity to defeat efforts to create division and disunity. That means changes in the environmental movement. It also means changes in other movements, uh, how to work from both sides to overcome divisions. Um, and this massive anti-extreme right coalition needs to address issues, including environmental ones, both as part of electoral campaigns, but also as part of ongoing work to build and grow organization. So we're just about uh, done. So I wanted to open the floor up again for questions, comments, things you'd like us to address, and then I will um, remind people about the session next week and what we'll cover. And uh, I have uh, a request for a couple of volunteers to do a little homework. So the floor is open for more comments and thoughts. Use your the picture of your hand, click it, and we'll open your mic. Cameron, your mic is open. Cameron Dixon. You need to click your mic on your end. Click the picture of your mic on your end. It's open on our end. Click, use your mouse. Hover over the picture of the mic on your control panel. Click it and it will open. Okay, you still haven't done that. All right, move on. Daniel, your mic is open. Hi. Um, so uh, this is the uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn Club in Berkeley. We're watching as a group. I believe uh, one of our. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Um, can you hear from here? Can you hear I, from here? No. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, so this is Judy Ann, and I am not generally very optimistic about uh, people's understanding all these connections, but yesterday in Berkeley, I had two experiences, one at a forum on housing and one at a, a neighborhood meeting about what development is going to be like in their neighborhood. Uh, as in many cities in this country, and never mind this country, in the world, uh, housing is needed for people who have lots and lots of money as compared to the overwhelming majority of others in the society. And there's been a big effort in Berkeley to by our quote unquote progressive leaders to uh, rectify that in some way. And in both of these meetings, the discussions included environmental concerns, included humanitarian concerns, and people actually said, it is not those individuals, it's the system, folks, you can't do it in a capitalist system. So we would like you leaders of the city to be saying that more often. We glad you pushed for the right things, but we would like you to be saying things. And it wasn't me, I wasn't the person saying that. It wasn't anybody from the Elizabeth Gurley Smith Club of the Communist Party of the USA. It was lots of other people there who were saying that it is the system. And it made me feel really good and I slept really well last night. So I want to share that with all of you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you.
it's it's my contention that that uh, environmental issues provide a new path to socialist consciousness because as soon as people become environmentally active on such issues and start to work for change, they run up against the system. They run up against bought and paid for politicians. They run up against powerful corporations. They run up against a legal system which enshrines private property rights over human rights. And th those that experience is convincing millions uh, to that a, a socialist path is necessary, that fundamental economic and political changes are necessary. So to the degree that our message resonates with reality, uh, we'll be able to organize more and more people and they will organize themselves. And that's indeed one of the very hopeful things. I often say that it's both worse than we think and better than we think. It's worse than we think because the changes that we don't necessarily fully understand yet can come to hurt humanity. Every new study is worse than the previous, what we previously thought the situation was. So it's worse than we thought, but it's also better than we thought because tens of millions of people and ultimately billions of people are coming to the, these same conclusions on their own or as part of uh, entering the movement. The, the million, tens of millions of teenagers who are uh, joining the climate movement, the climate strike movement, are getting an early education in struggle and in what it takes to organize and uh, what, why the system resists and uh, learned, learning important lessons that will help transform our world. So that, in that sense, it is better than we thought. Things are changing and more and more people are understanding. Uh, other uh, comments before we wrap up? Ishmael, your mic is open. Ishmael Parra, your mic is open. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, just first a, a comment uh, on the effects of climate change. Here in Cal Southern California, we've had almost 100 million, 100,000 houses that have been lost in the last couple of years because of wildfires. Uh, that are just burning uh, all of the uh, away all of uh, the small brush as a result of no rain and, and because of the change of the climate change of the winds what they call the Santa Ana winds and so forth the other thing is uh, what is what are what is the main gist of the of the uh, the Green New Deal presented in Congress and what is its current status right now in Congress uh, well, I will defer that question to the next session because we're going to talk about the Green New Deal in uh, in more detail then. Uh, that'll be part of talking about the climate strike movement, the Green New Deal, and efforts to um, around it and what it's already accomplished, and uh, some um, and a lot more discussion of the movements. So we will be discussing that in the next session. Uh, and it, it, what you say about fires is absolutely true. Over the past 40 or 50 years, there's a steady rise both in the number of forest fires and in the intensity of forest fires. Fires, some fires are burning so intensely now that instead of those forests being able to regenerate themselves in 80 years, 70 or 80 years, it will take 150 years because the fires are burning so hot that it's destroying the seeds in the ground. So the, these these impacts, that's just one of this web of interconnections that is impacting humanity and it impacts our housing, it impacts uh, the quality of life, uh, not this summer, but the previous summer here in the Pacific Northwest, the entire Northwest uh, was had uh, terrible air because there were 600 forest fires in British Columbia and Washington State and the air for everybody was worse than uh, the uh, what people talk about the terrible air in Beijing. It was worse than the measurements were worse in Seattle and throughout the Northwest. So it, uh, these things affect, affect everything, housing, breathing, all that. Well, maybe time for one more uh, comment and then we'll wrap up. Ken, your mic is open. There you are. Greetings, comrades, sisters and brothers. Uh, we have a problem here in Philadelphia. We have a refinery which blew up. 
We secondly have a number of actual gas stations that are being pushed by, believe it or not, the public transit system here. <laughs> so we're having some major problems. My understanding is the president of the United States no longer has a position for science advisor. What would you suggest that we do from our end regarding that? Uh, well, the the, uh, the the number of things that are happening in the Trump administration, uh, that he, he not only has an empty position for science advisor, uh, there are many positions which are filled. They've disbanded boards of advisors for uh, everything from the Parks Department to the uh, the uh, the EPA. They've appointed people to head the EPA whose job it is to destroy all regulation and all enforcement. Um, so this is part of the effort to fundamentally change our country, to defeat Trump and Trumpism, to turn the country around, to have an aggressive program of real solutions rather than uh, what the Trump administration is, which is trying to drive us in the wrong direction as fast as possible. Um, so um, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, I will announce that I'm uh, going to be doing a little book tour. I'll be coming to Philadelphia on November 7th, Boston on November 2nd, New Haven on November 8th, and New York on November 14th for sessions around my book and a shorter version of the slideshow and a book discussion and book signing and a chance to meet people and talk in detail. Um, so I was hoping I could get several volunteers to start us off next week with their own personal experiences of environmental struggles. It could be about your participation in one of the recent climate strikes or an environmental crisis in your town or city or a challenge in your union between jobs and environment. Just I want looking for two or three people who can start us off with, uh, you might say, little case studies of um, some of these details. So, so are there, are there, is there a volunteer or three for who would be willing to prepare to help kick off our session next week? Like a two or three minute uh, discussion. So you're asking people to raise to, their to hand? Raise their hand and volunteer to be one of those people. Ken Hurd has his hand raised. Very good. Now, um, and anyone else? Just a minute. Cindy has her hand raised. Maybe I should open. Do you want me to open to see, let them talk? Uh, no, we'll, we'll, if, if they'll volunteer, we'll call on them at the start of next week's session and uh, give them a couple of minutes to give their case studies. <laughs> 